Well, welcome to the Firehouse. I'm Pastor Steve. If you don't know me today, we continue the series, Burn the Ship. This is week number seven. Again, I urge you, if you haven't seen all the videos, that you go back and you check them out. I think it would be well worth it. And uh, But today is, is week number seven. A few people have asked me, hey, w when's it going to be over? I, I don't know. Uh, I really don't know. Uh, today, we're going to do it today. I'll let you know at the end. I won't let you know at the end. I won't know. Next Sunday, you'll know whether or not this series is over. But um, I I've been encouraged by this series, to be honest with you. I'm learning a lot. And uh, I know that might be hard for you to believe that I'm learning something that I'm writing down. But the more I pray, the more I ponder and, and wait upon the Lord for this message, I, I see more and more things. And I, I want to share those with you. That's how I see preaching is just sharing the word of God with people so that they get the, the note that God loves them. So here's what we've looked at so far. You got to decide to torch or to burn your ship. You can't burn half of it, three quarters of it, 99.9%. .9%. You have to burn your ship. What's your ship? Is your life, your old life. You got to get rid of it. You got to dump it out of your life. You got to torch it so there's absolutely nothing left to it. So there's no going back. You can't go back. Because once you go back, you think you're only going to go back for a minute. No, you're going to go back and you're going to stay. So you got to understand that's one of the things that we looked at. There's no do-overs, do no going back. You're done with it. The next thing that we've been looking at is that you have to put things in order. See, it's not this self-help kind of thing where you're just going to say, I'm not going back, I'm not going back, I'm not going back, I'm not going back. Those are just mere words. You have to be empowered by God's Holy Spirit and you have to understand what has been paid for your life. And last week we looked at this fancy word called propitiation, which means that Jesus Christ was the sacrifice for us. He was offered up for us, for our sins, and for our offenses against his father. And yet his father, God, decided to send Jesus Christ as payment for our offense. Even though his son had no offense on him, he became offense for our offenses so that God can forgive us of our offense. And I'm not repeating that because I, I don't think I could. So the thing is, God wants to give you a new life. He wants to give you a new life. The question begs though, how bad do you want a new life? Or do you just get content in the fact things are the way they are? I believe that as we continue to look at this series, hopefully you'll understand a little better because today, today is about answering the call. Now you might ask yourself, what call? Am I waiting for a call? What call am I really waiting for? The call that I believe that all of us, if you ask Christ to come in your life, it's the call that every one of us should be waiting for. We should be listening for it. It is a call that is life changing to us. It's, an, it's a call that is another step in the process of burning down the ship. Because if you answer this call, you then know that you have burned your ship. If you ignore this call, you better go back to the beginning and see if really you're going to continue, if you're continuing to think that you burned the ship. Oh, I'm willing to burn the ship. I'm willing. But you haven't. It's important for us to look at this. So I wrote this kind of thing out. Coming to Christ means just that. You're going from where you currently were to him. It's a simple equation. When you come to Christ, you move from here to there. Old life to Calvary. Old life to cross. Old life to forgiveness. Old life to mercy. Old life to grace. You move forward. You move towards Him. You're going to change. One of the things you have to understand, it's a simple illustration, but I believe that for many people, it's a big area of struggle. We, especially here in the American church, we just want things nice and easy and done for us. My wife and I have been watching things and seeing things, not just that are on the news, but we check out, as others do, check out other ministries that are going on right now in Ukraine. 
and in the surrounding areas, like in Poland and, and Romania and all these other countries that are there taking in over a million and a half refugees right now. Samaritan's Purse is currently in these countries helping and, and showing it, it, people love and, 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 and bringing them the things that they need. They're, they're risking their own lives. And, but what's amazing is you see people in these bomb-ridden cities and they are still meeting and sharing the gospel of Christ with each other. They're not stopping gathering together in the name of the Lord. They know what it means to come to Christ. You know why they know? And I believe this with all my heart. Because it's a struggle. It's a physical struggle for them to stay alive. So therefore it puts everything in perspective. But us in the American church, everything is so easy. Everything is so done for us that we don't really struggle. And I believe with all of my heart, struggling is good for the Christian believer. Not that I look forward to it, not that I'm asking God, oh, please let me struggle. But struggling is not a bad thing. I was just, uh, we were talking about the other day, I st we were at a, um, a, a funeral not so long ago and saw some of our old kids from our youth group of, th of 38 years ago. Some of them are serving Christ today, some of them aren't serving Christ today. And I've said this before, and I'll say it again. One of the, I believe one of the downsides for us being youth pastors for nine years and having a great youth group is that we did way too much for those kids. We do way too much in our churches for people. We babysit them. We powder their fannies. We, we spoon feed them. And when, when their life hits the fan and when things are, are just in their face, they don't, they don't stand. Why? Because they, they haven't struggled. I'm telling you, to come to Christ, you'll have a struggle. When you come to Christ, you're going to have a battle. When you come to Christ, the devil's just not going to go, oh, okay, I lost that one, darn. Except he'll use the other D word. You know, see, he's allowed to swear. Some of you are like, well, I don't understand. See, but it's a struggle. But I'm here to encourage you, according to God's word, don't quit. So, here's a note. You can't have both things in your life. You can't have your ship and you can't have your new life in Christ. You can't have your old life and you can't have your new life. You can't do it. In fact, there's, uh, Jesus teaches a parable, it just came to mind, where he talks about the wineskins. You can't put new wine in wineskins that are old. It'll blow a hole in them. Because of ferment, for, fermenting process will just blow a hole in it. You can't put God's spirit in a sinful life. The only prayer, and I've said this, and, and some people don't, don't agree. Okay, you don't agree. I also believe Michael Jordan was the best basketball player to play the game. You may not agree with that too. That's your opinion. The only prayer that God hears from a person that does not know Jesus Christ is the prayer of repentance to ask God for forgiveness for his salvation. Because prior to that, since you don't have his spirit in your life, God cannot look upon you because we're sinful. It's only through the blood of Jesus Christ that God can see us and hear us. So I'm just telling you right now. The only prayer God ever heard from my life. Actually will happen tomorrow. Th 48 years ago. Tomorrow. That was the first prayer God ever heard from my life. Yo Jesus. Come into my life. You leave me I'll hate you. Till the day I die, I give him my heart. First one. First tier. New life. So you got to understand, there's a process to this, and you just can't say, I burned my ship, I'm okay. No, now, now you got to come to Christ. And I'm going to explain that a little bit more. We either are going to leave behind our old life, or we're going to take on our new life, one or the other. Jesus teaches about this. Turn your Bibles to the book of Matthew, chapter 6. Matthew, chapter 6, verse number 24. Christ, again, is teaching. And some people say, well, he's only teaching to the Jews. Because, that, the, listen, it's in the Bible. Whether you're Jewish or non-Jewish, read it. 
it's good for you. And it's got points. Okay? Matthew chapter 6, verse number 24, Jesus teaches and says this, No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. For some, it says, for the other translations, it says wealth. But the more direct translation, especially out of the King James, says mammon. So Jesus is teaching and he's saying, listen, you can't love two masters. Only one can be in charge of you. Therefore, it's a master. Because if you love this one, you're going to hate that one. If you love that one, you're going to hate that one. If you hate that one, you're going to love that one. If you love that one, you're going to hate that one. I think I said it correctly. You have to realize he's saying no one can do that. Why? Because you're conflicted. You're double-minded. Paul talks about being double-minded later on in the scripture. He says you can't be double-minded because you're tossed to and fro. That's why so many people bounce all over with their faith because they're double-minded. They really haven't made Jesus Christ the master of their life. They thought they have. But he says very plainly, you can't have please too. You can't love too. So it says you cannot serve both God and mammon. Okay, so what does mammon mean? It's very simple. What it represents is the world's possessions, the world's thoughts, the world's ideas, the world's standards. That's what he says, mammon. It just doesn't mean money. Now, I've heard a lot of preachers say, that's money. So this is how you defeat it. You just reach down in them pocketbooks of yours, and you just write yourself a real nice check to the church right now, or my ministry, put your hands on the television, say baby. And you listen to me, and you just send this in, and you're going to be blessed above a measure. It's going to be cup runneth over, shaken down, whatever. No. That's not what it means. It means don't let the world control you. Now, if money does control you, you won't tithe. You won't give because it's your God. But the fact is, he's just not talking about money. He's talking about so much more. Don't let the standards of this world rule your life. Don't let the beliefs of others rule your life. Don't let the, the thought pattern of society rule your life. Because what you've done is you've made that a God. When you start, when we start to compromise God's word to fit in, then what we have done is we are following, <coughs> excuse me, Mammon, we're following the ways of the world. Jesus says you can't follow both. You can't do both. He's calling us out on that. He's saying you have to leave the one and go to the other. There's no in between. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, we are warned to come out from this because only destruction awaits those who don't. Only destruction. What's the way of the world? Destruction. The way of the world, you go through your stomach. How many of you ever eaten too much? All right, how many of you ate too much for breakfast this morning? It's gotten a little warm in here, your blood sugar's starting to drop, and you're just like, good night, amen. A little tip for you. If you ever doze off in church and you get startled, just go amen. <laughs> just saying it, just amen. People will be like, dude, they were just resting in the spirit. Okay? I learned that in Bible college. <laughs> Mr. Tra or Brother Troller. Amen. Yep, yep. It wasn't resting my eyes. It was just resting in the arms of Jesus. But we're warned to come out from this. Because only destruction awaits those who don't. In the book of Revelation, chapter number 18. Book of Revelation, chapter number 18. I'm going to get to the verse I want. But just so you know what this chapter is about. It's about Babylon. It's about... Babylon and basically what Babylon represents and there's a lot of studies out what Bible scholars and pro uh, people of prophecy call which uh, country Babylon there's a lot of different studies they're awesome um, I, I find it fascinating but I probably won't find this out because I'll be raptured the Jesus is going to come back before this comes into play but just so you know it's just it's there but it's important to know this so when he talks in the book of Revelations about Babylon, what he's basically talking about is the lust of mankind. Babylon was the, was the embodiment of lust of man. 
Babylon was like the heathen country, heathen society that just ruled everything. Babylon. And so when he talks about it, he talks about the lust of mankind. It talks about the splendor of Babylon, uh, how the allure of beauty draws so many people in. And that uh, Babylon is attractive. Now let me say this. You're only attracted to stuff through lust. Okay? And, and let me explain that. When you see something and you just put no thought into it, but you say, I want that. That's lust. Because it hits you so quick. If you could say, well, it was, it was love at first sight. Okay, we'll give it time. Because the fact of the matter is, time is what's going to tell whether it was love or lust. And that could be for a person, it could be for things, it could be for whatever. But what Babylon encapsulates is this love of the world. Look at what we have done. There's no standards, there's no, there's no morals, there's no restrictions, it's just the way we are. And Jesus warns about there in Revelation chapter 18, through, as John writes this gospel, God speaks to him through the Spirit. Revelation chapter 18, verse number 4 says this, then John, he's writing this, Then I heard another voice from heaven say, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues. Verse number 5. For her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. Jesus is calling man out of the world. He's saying here, as John heard these words, come out of her. Come out of Babylon. Come out of your old life. Come out of your old lust, your old desires, your old standards. Come out. He's not saying stay put by no means. He's saying come out. Your house is on fire. Do you stay in there? Or do you come out? You come out of your house because your house is on fire. Your sewage backed up in your house. Do you stay in your house? <laughs> do you stay in your house when your sewer backs up in your, uh, into your tubs, into your toilet, into your sink, into your basement? I've been in houses like that. Oh, side note. So, a little plumbing humor. So, back in Pittsburgh, you know, home of the six-time world champion. I was a carpenter, but I also worked with a friend of mine. He was a plumber. And he was a great, he's an awesome plumber. So, one night he calls me, Saturday night, I'll never forget. He goes, hey, Steve, I got to go route out of basement. Sewage backed up. Can you meet me? Sure. Not doing anything. Weren't married. So, off I went. Because I was going to make $3 an hour. So I went there, and uh, sure enough, as soon as you open the door of the house, it, uh, it like takes your breath away, okay? Now, we got hip boots on, waders, you know, and because uh, then we hose them off and go fishing with them. But anyway, uh, so, so we, we walk down the basement. It's just, you know, about yo deep. And it just, things are floating, like all over. I mean, it's full. I mean, it's full. So here, here's what you got to do. You, you got to find the drain. Now, how do you find a drain when it's this murky, brownish colored water? Yeah, how do you find it? Well, you got to take a pole and you just start guessing where you think it might be until you hear kink, kink, when you're tapping the, the cast iron drain. So then you got to reach down with a hook and pull it out. Well, still nothing's moving. Why? Because it's clogged. And then you got to drop the thing down and route it out and, and pull it out. Hopefully your gloves don't have a leak in them. And so you pull them out and, you know, wait for things to start to flow. And it does the first, like, five or six times. And pull it out. It's, if you ever stir stuff up, it just, you know what I'm saying. Just. <laughs> finally, you see this thing starting to go. Then you got to squeegee the whole floor. Then you got to hose it down and hose off your boots and everything. So it was like already 8.30 at night. He goes, you want to go get something to eat? <laughs> sure, I'm starved. I just made $9. <laughs> so we go to the country house or the uh, wagon wheel, wagon wheel restaurant. 
right there on North Huntington. Go there and sit down and busy time, you know, everybody, a lot of people are there. Order our food, notice people are leaving and realize we're the only one left in that whole area. And I realized we smelled. We smelled real bad. You don't stay in your house with that kind of stench, do you? God's saying, get your rear end out of that house. Get out of here. So see, when we look at our lives like that, like things floating around, maybe it helps us to realize what a sinful life really looks like. Because it can look really good. We can mask over that. We could have put one of those little plug-ins in. But the fact of the matter is, that's our lives without Christ. And here in Revelation 18, 4, he's saying, I heard another voice, come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues, for her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. There's judgment going to fall. It's going to fall, and it's going to fall hard. And God's saying, I want you out. Come out of there. Leave your old past behind. Judgment won't fall upon you. But do people listen? All of this looks good until it's not. All of it looks good until it's not. So let's get back to the call. The call that, you know, I started out with, like, what's the call? We must see. We are being called, called out of our old life into our new life. But there's a call that follows this. Turn your Bibles to the book of Isaiah chapter 6, verse number 8. Isaiah chapter 6. Verse number 8. In fact, this is one of the founding principles of this church, the Firehouse Chapel, which, by the way, in September will be 20 years old, which is pretty amazing. And we're looking forward to celebrating that together in September as we celebrate 20 years. But this is one of the foundational principles of the whole Firehouse Church. Isaiah chapter 6, verse number 8. Isaiah writes, Then I heard a voice, the voice, of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? Question mark. And who will go for us? Question mark. And I said, I responded, I declared, here I am, send me. Isaiah was called. Who shall I send? Who will go? That's a call right here. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, who shall I send? Who will go for us? He's calling out to mankind. Who will go? And Isaiah steps straight up to the plate. He says, I will send me. Every Christian, every believer in Christ must heed that call. That's not to a particular group of people. That's not just to a pastor, not to an evangelist, not to uh, uh, whatever. It's to every believer in Christ. Who shall I send? Who? He's calling out to us. And our response, your response is a lot easier if you've gotten rid of your old life because you're like, here I am, send me. I'm ready to go. When a person gets a hold of the enormity of their sin, and uh, I know Alexis mentioned about the songs about the cross, and, and she asked me, like she said earlier, Dad is... You know, are you talking about the cross today? And like she said, I talk about it all the time. And I got to be honest with you, I will talk about it every Sunday because that's what changes people's lives. Amen. It's not how eloquent I am. And you guys know I'm eloquent. <laughs> right? No, it's the cross, man. There's only one way to Christ. Cross. Yeah, I heard he did that. So if I need to grow. Okay, watch me. Get to the cross. No, no, no. I really need to grow. Get to the cross. No, I, I, I'm thinking I need to go to the cross. You're going to find out so much more if you just go to the cross. But see, the thing is, it's the cross is where we find the forgiveness of our sin. And if you don't think you're that sinful of a person, you don't need that much grace. If you don't need that much grace, why do you need God? Because, hey, you're a good person. See, that's the circular reasoning that goes on in people's minds. We try to rationalize and reason everything away. We make excuses, for example. We make excuses for why we don't have to or why this happened to us or why we act the way we do. I was reminded when I was writing this down a number of years ago, I was at a wake and uh, saw a guy I hadn't seen. He hadn't been in church for a long, long time. Him and his family used to come to church and stuff. 
I said, hey, and I said, I remembered his name, and I said, hey, how's the family doing? Oh, you know, good, and, yeah, and, then, and then just blurts things out. People ever blurt stuff out to you, or is it just me? Sometimes people just blurt stuff out. Sometimes not the best place to do it, but they figure, hey, I'm just going to blurt it out anyway. My daughter never went back to church after talking to you. Oh. Okay. In fact, none of us go to church because of you. Oh. Okay. Dead guy's right there. People are crying. I'm like, oh, okay. I was, I was curious. I'm like, you know, now I'm trying to, like, remember first who's his daughter. And then I start to remember. And then I'm like, what did I say? What, what did I, what could I, what, I, I, I know I say dumb things, but that had to be a big one. Well, her and her fiance came to me. And he told me this, her and her fiance came to me, wanted me to do their wedding. I'm like, cool. Well, let's talk about the relationship. So where do you live and where do you live? Now, they were both in their late 20s, mid 20s, I think. You saw, I, I, I don't know, I asked questions. Well, we live together. We bought a house together. Okay, okay, you bought a house together. So that takes me on a different path in, in counseling because there's other issues now. I just want to help them. So I said, okay, do you guys do... Because mm -hmm? I need to know. Are you just roommates? You just, you know, one person in one room, the other in another? And they, you know, kind of got a little tough in me. I said, okay, here's, here's my suggestion. You can't sell your house because you bought it but here's what I want you to do there's like six months till their wedding you move in that bedroom you move in the other bedroom no touchy <laughs> take it to the cross ask God to forgive you let him cleanse you let's make it right let's ask God not to bless your mess let's ask him to bless your marriage Amen. just let, let's let's do that now, I've said that for years to couples. Some have agreed. Some have done it. Some have agreed and lied to me. That's on them. I, I'm not going to be like under their bed. Go, I see you, boo! <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I totally would. Right? Yeah, that's how you get shot. Uh, okay, here's my point. That was like 12 years ago. And they don't go to church because of me, because I told them the truth. But they're going to use me as an excuse. See what I'm saying? Yeah. We're good at this. We're, we're, we're so good at this stuff. When we get our fanny blown off because of what, what's said, oh, it's his fault, her fault. No, man, it's our fault. And here, right here, we have to understand. When we understand the enormous debt we owe with our sin, we go to the cross and we find forgiveness. There's hope there. You're not looking for an excuse. You're uh, have I ever been zinged? Yes. Has sure ever been zinged? Yes. All of us have been zinged by God's word at one time or a hundred times in our lives. The thing that shows maturity in Christ is whether or not you will take that zing as godly correction or you will take it as just being God being critical and hating you. And how you take it as godly correction? When you've burned your ship. When you say no more. When you say no more. Jesus is our master. Get that clear. We are his followers. Get that clear. So if Jesus is our master and we are his followers, then what should we do? We should follow him. Turn your Bibles to the book of Romans chapter 8. I'm going to hurry because I want to get to this. Romans chapter 8, verse number 28. Romans chapter 8, verse number 28. As this is written, it says this. And we know, and this is a great passage of scripture. And we know that all things work together for good for those who love God. For those who are called, get the word, called according to his purpose. 
And we know that all things work together for good for those who love God. Now, a lot of people take that as great encouragement. I take that as great encouragement. A lot of people take that, well, if God loved me, why did this happen? Or if God loved us, why does he allow a child to die? Why does he allow these people in Ukraine to be bombed? Why does he allow sickness to hit us? Why, 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 why? Okay. See, that's where, again, we have to understand who the, is the God of this world. It's a little G and Satan. Satan brings death and destruction and hatred and prejudice and all these other things to the world. Not God with a big G, the little G guy. He does it. Get that through in your head. But see, it's a lot easier to blame the big G for the, what the little G does because we don't really believe in the little G, so we just blame it all on the big G that he really doesn't care about us. But let me tell you something. God does care enough that he sent his only begotten son that whosoever believe in him would never perish but have everlasting life. For God sent his son into the world not to condemn the world, but to do what? To save the world. So you tell me, you try to form a, 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 an argument that God doesn't care about us. So right here it says this, and we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose. Well, is that a qualification? No, we're all called. You accept Christ, you're called for his purpose. So answer the call. What's the purpose? Now, a lot of people just read over that, but you have to re realize the purpose has a meaning to it. It's a symbol. It's written, and if you study it, it is a symbol that recognizes sacrifice and dedication. So he's basically calling us according to his sacrifice and dedication. You just can't read symbol because, oh, it's just a symbol. It's just a symbol. It's just a, like the little, you wear a little cross around your neck. You got a little fish on the back of your car, whatever it is. I got a fish in the back of my window, but it says little fisherman. Uh, but anyway, so it's a whole different fishing. I'm not the fisherman. I like bass fishing. So anyway, we go on, but it says right here, this is more than just a, a, pur a purpose. It, it's, a, it's a symbol. For example, where it really goes back to in the Old Testament. And there's this thing called showbread, S-H-E-W-B-R-E-A-D, showbread, not showbread, showbread. All right, so it's different. My accent may throw it off on you a little bit. You guys out here in Chicago, Chicago, you might say it a little different, but yuns are wrong. All right, so it, it says showbread, S-H-E-W-B-R-E-A-D. So what is that? Showbread, back in the time of the tabernacle in the Old Testament, there was, there was the, the, the holy place and, and, the, and, the, and the inner room and all these other places. There were different rooms here in the tabernacle. And out on a golden table, there were 12 loaves of bread, unleavened bread, that were laid out. Six and six, two rows of six that were laid out. Those were showbread. Those were laid out before the Lord. Each one of those loaves represented one of the nations of Israel because there was 12 nations of Israel. So that represented the 12 nations of, of, of the Jewish nation laid out before God. Here we are. It's a remembrance. Now, what it was, was it was a reminder that the Jews, for the Jews, that God was the resource of life and nourishment. See, so when they went in, they realized that there were 12 loaves of bread. The Jewish people would go in and they would realize, oh, this is our nourishment. This is our hope. We put it before the Lord, which is exactly what we're supposed to do. So when it talks about the purpose, it's going back to the illustration of the showbread. Uh, uh, um, when uh, communion, when Jesus was with his disciples in the upper room. Remember? What did he take? Did he take a piece of bread, a loaf of bread, right? Why did he take a loaf of bread? Why didn't he take something else? Why did he take a loaf of bread? You ever thought about it? I have. The reason he took, took a loaf of unleavened bread and broke that piece of unleavened bread was to go back to fulfill what was done in the Old Testament in the tabernacle with the 12 showbread, uh, showbread loaves there, two rows, six in each row. So what he did is he took that bread then and he took it up before the Lord and he broke it and he gave thanks and he said to his disciples, what? This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, he broke this piece of bread as his life would be broken because his purpose was to redeem man. He was our showbread. So look at this. Here he's talking about this and he said that we have a purpose. Our life in Christ becomes new. Our life in Christ becomes something more than just us. Our life in Christ becomes a sacrifice to him. And where do we put our hope and our trust and our faith in? Him. 
him. As, those, as, as the Jewish people would look at those 12 loaves of bread and they realized that their, their, their very existence came from the hand of God, we then have to realize that our very existence comes from Jesus Christ. And because of that, we also have a purpose. And that's to leave our old life behind and to take on the new life in Christ. So, here we are. We're laid out before the Lord. He has a purpose. He, has, he, he must become the source of our lives. Now, this only happens when you're willing to lay down your life. A lot of Christians don't want to lay down their life. They just want to say a quick prayer and move on. No, you got to lay down your life. I don't know how else to say it. you got to lay down your life. you got to say, here I am, Lord, send me. Like Isaiah said, here I am, Lord, send me. Yeah, but I don't know what, what, where it'll take me. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Uh, here I am, Lord, send me. I don't know what he's going to have me say. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Here I am, Lord, send me. See, that's when you say, Lord, here I am, send me. Now, real quick, this comes when a life sees sacrifice as a blessing rather than as a punishment. Turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And I'm going to begin reading at verse number 26. And as Paul's writing to this, this is a powerful passage of scripture that I just don't want to gloss over, but we'll, we'll probably explain. I, by the way, I don't think we'll be done with this series today, just so you know. Okay. All right. So 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 26. Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Oh, there's that word called again. There's the, the word. Think of what you were when you called. I do. I can think of where. I tell people all the time, don't dwell on your past sin. Don't dwell on your past life, but don't forget where you came from. You know what I'm saying? Don't forget. So right here it says, remember where you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. <laughs> Any takers on that one in here? <laughs> Not many of you were influential. Not many of you were noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and, dis and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God that is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Remember where you were when you're called. You're not going to fix your own life. But God can use you. There's people that walk around. Some of you are here today. Some of you are watching at home. You are so filled with regret and remorse. You wish you could do that one thing over again and redo it and fix it. And it's just wearing on you and you can't. There's no way back. There's no way to correct it. You have shame. You have whatever you have. Let me tell you something. That all disappears at the foot of the cross. It all disappears. When he says, remember where you were before you were called. But look at where you're at now. He takes the morons and does great things. He takes the broken and makes them whole. He takes the discarded and uses them. And sometimes that's what we need in our life because that makes us realize who's really the source of our strength. Capiche? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, God, we look to you. You are the author, finisher, and perfecter of our faith. And God, today, I pray people will answer that call. The call, first of all, to come to know you in their heart as their Lord and Savior. Then the call, Lord Jesus, to come out of the old life and step into the new. Then the call, Lord, to send us out into this world to proclaim Christ to a lost and dying world. God, we need to hear this call. I pray that right now, Father, people's hearts would be open. With every head bowed and every eye closed, we do this every, every Sunday. If you're at home, you can be with us on this too. If you want to start your journey, saying goodbye to the old life, stepping into the new, I want to pray for you. How we do it in a moment, I'll ask you to look at me. Once you make eye contact and close your eyes and I will pray for you right where I'm at and right where you're at. Starting on my left, you want to pray that? Look at me right now. All I guess to your eyes. Sure. 
God, any more? Cool. My right. God, yep. Awesome. Cool. Pray this from your heart. Jesus, here I am. I want to answer that call to come to you. I'm a sinner. I need you. I ask you to come into my heart, into my life. Forgive me of my sin. Set me anew. I stand today and burn this ship. I walk away. But I walk into you, into your arms, your blessing, your forgiveness, your hope, your glory. Receive me now, I pray in Jesus' name. Why don't you all stand? I'm going to close in prayer, but if you would like prayer this morning, we've got people up here that would like to pray for you. Don't forget, Tuesday night we have prayer. Love to have you. Friday night's to get together. Love to have you there too. Let me close. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing, the blessings that you've given us, the precious gift of salvation. Now, Lord, equip us to take us out into a lost and dying world. In Jesus' name we pray and ask. Amen. God bless.